Okay, we're going to be in Proverbs um, 22, verse number 6 tonight. And it says, very simple verse, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. All right, what does that mean to you? I'm going to do things a little different in this one. So uh, this is kind of like what I like to do on Wednesday night. I like to get a little bit of involvement. Sometimes it bites me. Because anytime you invite people to say something, you just never know what's coming out. But I feel pretty good about this audience, really do. So when it says train up a child in the way that you should go, what does that mean? How would, and, and really, you know, it, uh, some say, I'm not going to say anything because, you know, I could be wrong and I don't want to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. And you may not even be wrong. You probably are right. This group, I would say, is probably going to be right. What does that mean to you? What's that? Okay, bring them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Okay, good. Anybody else? Okay, they're following what you should, what you tell them to do. Okay, what else? Anything else? What about the last part of that verse? Train up a child in the way, way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does the last part of that speak to you? Could be really good or really bad. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. When I, when I start having children, this verse was told to me often. And it was not presented to me in the way that I understand it now. And this verse always intimidated me because when it says train up a child in the way that he should go, that says that, okay, this is talking to parents, right? It's, t- it's talking to us. You train up a child in the way, should go, way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So to me, this is what it meant. It said, if I do A, B, and C, then I am guaranteed a good outcome with my kids. So if I train them up in the way they should go, and I do that right, they're not going to venture away from the Lord. They're not going to rebel against the Lord, and their lives are going to be good. Our family's going to be good. Everything's going to be wonderful. But what if they don't? What does that mean? Does it mean I messed up? That means I didn't do what I was supposed to do. If my kids don't fall in line, then I have messed up. And so I, I was, this, this verse intimidated me tremendously years and years ago. And somebody said something to me one time that really helped me with this verse. They said, Brian, this is a book called Proverbs, not a book called Promises. Proverbs means wise sayings. So if I look at this as a wise saying and not a promise, then I understand that, okay, this is something that I should do that's very wise of me is to train up at my children in the way that they should go. And it is my heart's desire that when they get old, they will not depart from the things that I have taught them. Okay, that makes sense. But I also realized in that, that if they do depart it's not necessarily because I have done something wrong. Okay, I have a free will. I choose to do what I do. My children have the same free will, and they choose to do what they do. That doesn't mean that I control their free will. They do. That's why it's called a free will. They can do what they want to do. And so this verse was always an issue for me until I really got in and studied it. And through the years, God has helped me a lot with it. So this is kind of where we're going to be tonight. And, uh, uh, and so we're going to just take a look at it a little bit. Um, because, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that you can do all the things right and something hap- can, can happen. For instance, um, we, we have a, a family in our church that the, is a single mom, 
She's got two daughters. And she was married before, and she it was a very difficult marriage. Uh, she thought he was a believer, and he professed to be a believer, supported her in, in her church, and, and she got married to him, and she realized, uh-oh, this guy is not who he said he was. And so he was very verbally abusive uh, to her, to the children, and that came to a point, uh, there was some issues, some alcohol abuse and things like that, which led to a divorce. In that divorce, these girls went through some very traumatic experiences. And so what it has done is single mom has been training up these children uh, she has been laxed in some areas and accepted some behaviors that maybe you look on the outside and you say, okay, that you shouldn't do that. Matter of fact, I'll say this. She is dating a gentleman in our church. Great thing. I love them both. I think they would make a great couple. He's older, raised his family. She's obviously still got, I think, a 9-year-old and a 15-year-old or 10 and 15-year-old, so and, and he's, you know, older. But one of the things he says, and he's very, one thing about this gentleman, he's very much God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word. So if he sees one of the girls acting in a way that's not respectful or reverencing her mom uh, or, or respecting, honor, and obeying her mom, he's like, whoa, 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 you can't let that happen. But then she says, no, wait a minute. You don't understand where these girls have been. These girls have been through some very traumatic experiences. And so I am showing a lot of grace because I'm looking at the long term and not the short term. And so, you know, and I can tell you these things because you don't know them and you never will know them. Uh, but my wife has met with her and she's explained things. And Stacy's like, I get it. I get it. So there's traumatic things that happen that come into a life, a divorce, uh, different trauma, losing a parent that can really cause a child to kind of spin off in, in a difficult um, place. Bullying, uh, girlfriends and boyfriends, you know, can happen. And I've seen that a lot where a good Christian boy or girl will begin to date someone that's not equally that way, and it'll cause problems. Uh, maybe it's wrong friends, maybe social media, wrong influences, and it's like, ugh. So you do all the things right, and then something happens, and it's like, it's like uh, my, uh, I had an old GPS, an old Garmin. No, it was a TomTom. -Tom. And uh, back when they had those things that would sit on your dash, young people, you probably don't have any idea what that is. It's on your phones now. But it was, they, they were just GPSs, and I think my parents still use theirs. Uh, even though they got it on their phone, they still use that thing. They set it on the dash. And one of the things that was neat about it is when you would go off the wrong direction, you take a wrong turn, it's a recalculating or redirecting, uh, and, and it was recalculating, and that woman's voice would come on, and it would just say that over and over again until I shut the thing off and said, I know what I'm doing. I think in, 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 in family, sometimes we have to recalculate. We have to redirect. We have to, okay, we've got to take another look at this thing, and we've got to figure out how to get back on course. And so as a parent, you know, training up is not just, hey, everything's going to go fine. Sometimes life happens, and, and we got to recalculate and start all over again. And sometimes it can be a minor adjustment. Sometimes it's a major adjustment with our children. Uh, we're, we had one that we had uh, some issues, boy issues, with a family in the church. Oh, boy. And as a pastor, those things are, you know, when you got – your kids dating people in the church, uh, that's good and that's bad. Because usually when there's a problem with the kids, there becomes a problem with the parents, and then you lose, sometimes you lose people. We did, and it really messed up my daughter. Um, she saw a leader in our church really act horribly, horribly, and blamed her for all of the bad in their life. Blame my daughter. And so it took years, years for my daughter, and she still struggles today 
with relationships because she saw what happened and that she took responsibility as the running them out of the church and we tried to tell her listen this isn't you this is not your fault this is not what you did it was them and so finally I, I appreciate about this about God God reveals things in his time and he has shown me her our family and our church that what that right there was not her fault because usually people who do things like that God reveals things eventually anyway so I guess what I'm saying the long way around is you know sometimes we have to recalculate sometimes things happen out of our control that we have to readdress so it says train up it means to teach if you look it up in Strong's it means to teach it means to dedicate to dedicate Uh, this was written to parents so uh, we, first of all, we must dedicate ourselves to the Lord before we can ever dedicate ourselves to teach and train. Otherwise, it will not last. We just had Mother's Day. We uh, had baby child dedication day. And I know a lot of churches do that. It's kind of a thing that, you know, a lot of us do. And, and I t- always tell our parents, listen, this is not just a ceremony. This, we, actually, we have them sign this paper uh, so, and not because we're going to hold them accountable, but we want them to understand that a child dedication is not just coming up before the church and praying for the child and praying for the parent. This is a lifetime dedication that begins with them dedicating themselves to the Lord to be the parents that God wants them to be. If they don't do that, if they're not dedicated to the Lord, then Dedicating your kids to the Lord probably won't work. It probably won't work. Um, so it's a, it's a dedicating of ourselves. It is to dedicate ourselves to the teaching and training of our children. We got te- we got to dedicate ourselves to that. And oh, I could write a book. I think sometimes that's hard. It's hard. Because, you know, we get busy with life, and life happens to us, and life happens to our kids. And, you know, it, it's hard to be in and out, day in, day out, really focused on that. But it's, it's important, and we have to. So it's dedicating ourselves to the teaching and training of our children daily. It's also, we also must dedicate our children to the Lord. You know, it's dedicating our children. You know, what does that mean? Uh, and I, I go always go back to uh, Samuel. Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord. Uh, and that meant she gave him to God. And she understood that he was not hers, but he was lent to her. That God, she gave him back to God. God used Samuel in a great way. Uh, I, I think we, are, we need to be careful that we don't take ownership of our kids. Now, I know it sounds weird. We, we, we know there are kids. God has lent them to us to train them, to teach them, so that they can grow up to be integral parts of the body of Christ and to do the same thing that we have done with them, and that's to get married and raise children and reproduce, and so that we want that to keep going. So they are not our kids. It's, I, I tell the people this. In the church, same thing. Things God gives us, he lends to us. Our finances, they belong to him. They're not ours. And so we need to understand that, that we are stewards of what God has given us, not owners. A steward is someone that manages the affairs of others. So the children that God has given me are his, not mine. But I have the stewardship over them, and that's what we're talking about here. This is a... Not or this is not a one-time thing. It's continual. Training up our children is continual. It's kind of like train up. It's not a train them. It's train them up. It's it has the idea of an ongoing process that begins right there or six months earlier and goes all the way until they wave goodbye. Uh, either going off on their own or when they're in the back of the car or in the side of the car and they've got the just married sign uh, on the side, you know. And even then, we still as parents, 
I think, have an input into our kids. But this part of it is pretty much over at that point. And for me, that part is really over uh, for me, uh, but not for some of you. Uh, so it is a continual, not a one-time thing. So that's the training up. A child here refers to a child from infancy to adolescence. Uh, I shared with you yesterday that, I think it was, no, it was this morning, in our question and answer, when it's talking about uh, Jewish culture and customs that typically uh, when a child, a boy or a girl, and I forget what it's called with, it's a bar mitzvah, I think it's a bar mitzvah for the boys, and I can't think of what it is for the girls, but it's the ceremony whereby a Jewish boy or girl becomes a man or a woman. And it's interesting, you're about 13 with Jewish children. They be Now, I don't know how many of you would say my kid at 13 or 14 is old enough to be on their own and get married and have kids. But, you know, you look at Mary and Joseph. Mary was just a young teenage girl when she, when she got pregnant with Jesus. She was not very old. That was the way it was. And so a child refers to, you know, adult, small, going up to in the teenage years. For us, we have this idea that you're not an adult until you're 18, right? And then when you get to 18, you're kind of an adult, but then when you get to be 21, you're really adult and you have all the rights of being an adult. But um, actually, we our, our training needs to be completed by then. <laughs> we need to have it done, if at all possible. And then he talks about in the way, in the way. This is interesting. As I studied this out, you know, everything has a way about it. Uh, I don't know if you, you know this, but you probably do. Back before they were ever called Christians, they were called the people of the way. The way. Well, what does that mean? Jesus was the way. And so when you were called the people of the way or a person of the way, it meant that you were a follower of Christ and that you had did life a certain way. What was that way, Jesus. So you were a follower of Jesus. So you did, there was a way about you that was expected. There was a life that was expected. Uh, animals have a way about them. Uh, they were given that uh, by God, instincts and different things like that. They have a way. Mechanical things have a way about them. You, you know, a, a motor. Uh, if you have a combustion engine, it has a way about it, it the way it works. Um, humans have a way about them. The church has a way that it's supposed to function. There's some guidelines, it, but we can, you know, we can ex get out and we can do things differently. We have different ways of accomplishing the same thing. Uh, but there's a way about our children. Teach them or train them up in the way. So what, what does it mean? Generally speaking, our children have a way about them. Kids have a way. And we are to know our kids' way. Now, that involves a lot of different things. I, I wrote some things down at personality. Know your kids' personality. Know their strengths, their weaknesses. Know their motivations. Their love language is, is a helpful thing. Uh, that's words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Um, you know, my, I've got a daughter that loves physical touch. She loves to be hugged. And I've got another daughter that hates to be touched and hates to be hugged. Uh, so it's interesting, you know, as, as I'm learning my girls, you know, the one is one way and the other girl and the other. Now, the one that doesn't like physical touch, she likes acts of service. And she likes gifts. And so I learned that for her, serving her was a way that I could love her. And, and, and I, I need to know that because if I'm constantly trying to love the one that doesn't want to be touched, I'm going to, it's going to be frustrating to her. And so I need to learn that about her because that is her way. That's her way. My boy's different, and, and you have to learn their way. And so it's the idea of learning your kids. And we talked about that early, earlier today. You know, and for us as men, that's harder because we're generally not good at that. Now, there's some that are, uh, but generally speaking, 
We have to work at learning our kids. And I will also say this, our wives are a tremendous help in helping us learn our kids because they're very perceptive. Women are definitely more perceptive. My wife is great at reading people quicker than me. I just am very trusting and, you know, and that's sometimes to a fault. But I, I've had many times my wife will say, be careful there. And sometimes it'll be, it, it'll be like a, be careful of that woman. She's got a, she just, she has a, I think a lot of women have that. They just sense things. They're better at that than men. And when it comes to kids, I think moms are very, very good at understanding the kids quicker than dads are. And that's just, just, I think that's most, maybe not you guys. I, I don't know how you function, but it's definitely in our home. I count on my wife a lot for that. You're laughing. Is it good, right? Or my, huh? He said no. Okay. Hey. <laughs> That's good. Um, and so in the way, and then also they should go. The way they should go. Okay, so what is it in how a kids should go? I, I think there's a lot of things that we, we should look at. The Bible is definitely descriptive on a lot of things on how our kids should go. Um, there's their salvation. You know, we should work as parents to make sure that our kids understand salvation. Uh, I, I told you earlier, we were, we were blessed to be able to lead all of our kids to Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we were better parents. That's not what I'm saying. Don't take it that way. But it means that was important to us, and, and we taught them a lot. Stacy, more than me, she was a stay-at-home mom. And so she, she taught our kids a lot. It's interesting, my... My wife, Stacy, has a Sunday school class. She's a Sunday school teacher. She loves kids. She does well with kids, and kids love her to death. She hasn't met a kid that didn't love her, and she's just that person. And so she's got a group of uh, Sunday school class. It's probably, let's see, five, six, and seven-year-olds. Now, we have a bus ministry, and we go into it well, we, for Portsmouth Inner City, and we go into the housing projects, and we bring kids to church. Well, Stacy is teaching, and the particular topics was Jesus and salvation and the cross. And she came to me after, after Sunday school at one time, and she said, Brian, she said, you'll never believe this. She said, I got to talking about Jesus to these kids that were new in my Sunday school class, and she said they were absolutely clueless. They had never heard about Jesus. And I'm like, Really? Can a five, six, seven-year-old never hear about Jesus? But yeah. You know, I, I learned that children of Christians tend to be saved more predominantly than those of lost people. Why is that? Because they're around church. They're around Christianity. They hear about the gospel. And so uh, we still have people in our country that have never heard about Jesus. It's a sad, sad thing. Um, why? Because their parents are lost and they don't really have that concern. Um, but we need to, the way that they should go, number one, should be their salvation. Number two, should there be their sanctification or their growth? You know, we as parents, we need to try to help our kids grow in their relationship with the Lord. Then also, I would say God's plan for their life. Now, I teach... At our church, there is God's will and there's God's plan. Uh, I, I view them a little bit differently. Some don't, but I view God's will is that which God's word says to do. So predominantly as a Christian, God's will for my life, according to God's word, is pretty much the same as God's will for your life. Now, there's some differences because I'm a man and maybe you're a woman, so there might be a little bit difference there. But for the most part, God's will will always be tied to God's word. And so when somebody comes to me, and I've had this before, they'll say, Pastor, what's God's will for my life? And I'll say, I'll, give them, I'll show them the Bible. I said, that's God's will for your life. No, 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 Pastor. I want to know what God's will is for my life. And I'll say, oh, you mean God's plan for your life. God's will and God's plan are different. 
I believe God's plan for our life is not not which is spelled out in Scripture, but is what God would have us to do. For me, it was early on, it was um, being a well driller and a home builder, and then later on, God called me into ministry, and so God's plan for me was to uh, to do what I do. That's God's plan for, <clears throat> for me. And I always stress this, you will never know truly God's plan for your life until you really find out God's will for your life. If you're not doing his will, chances are you're not going to know his plan. And that's sad because I believe God has some tremendous plans for his people. But we sometimes miss them because we're not concerned with the things that he said, this is what I want you to do. And if we can't do the things that he says I want you to do, can we ever really know the things that he doesn't spell out? But I think we, like ministry, I think we can truly know what God's plan is for our life. I know. I know what I'm, where I'm at right now and what I'm doing is God's plan for me. Uh, I even know that being here today is God's plan for me. I don't understand all the time God's plan, but I'm confident in it because God gives me peace and God gives me direction. My, the Holy Spirit in me guides me and leads me. So, but that only comes as I submit to his will then I will understand his plan. So I tell this to adults and teenagers in college, listen, you need to find out God's will. Follow that, and God will show you his plan. Uh, Same with our kids. We encourage them in the things of God because we want them to know later on what God's plan is for their life. And so the way they should go is, uh, number salvation, number one, their sanctification or growth, number two, and in God's plan for our life. We want them to know that. We want them to follow that. Um. And then also I, I added a fourth one that's probably not in your notes as I went through this and looked at it again. Uh, gifts, talents, spiritual gifts. Uh, that, that, I believe, is important. I, we, we don't do it as often as we should, but we desire for our people to know what their spiritual gift is. And the reason we do this is because if you know your spiritual gifts. Now, as a child, it's a little hard. It, it, the more you grow and the older you get, the more you follow God's will, then you will begin to understand your spiritual gifts. But I believe we all have at least one spiritual gift. <clears throat> Knowing your spiritual gift is incredibly helpful in life because I believe that God will direct you in different areas of ministry, careers, uh, things that you enjoy, just God's plan for your life will really center a lot around your spiritual gifts. And if you know that, I've I've seen people in our church, and they're doing something in the church, they're serving in the church, and it's just like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And I'm thinking to myself, you are not working within your spiritual gifts, or it wouldn't be this difficult. But then I see people that, we've got a lady in our church, uh, her name is Donna, we've got a couple Donnas. And they are both very administrative. I, they've got the gift of administration. So if I've got something I need to do, I will call them and I'll say, listen, I need you to do this. I'm on it. Now, if I've got, if I need someone that um, maybe I need something with mercy, they're not the ones I would call. Because both of them would say, I don't, we don't have the gift of mercy. So I'm not going to ask them to do something that's really mercy oriented. I will work them within their spiritual gifts. As a dad, learning your kid's spiritual gifts, now singing is not a spiritual gift, but it is a definitely a gift and a talent. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but it, it's helping your kids find those spiritual gifts, finding out what they're, they're good at and where God is directing them. And that, that I believe, is, uh, again, the way or the, the way they should go. And so in this, I think I've got three points, and I would say we'll get done real quick, but um, we'll, we'll move through this pretty quick. Number one, train them to honor God, you, others, and themselves. And you say, why? Because that's what the Bible says. And that's what the Bible says. Parenting is really easier than we make it. Sometimes it can be hard to do it, but it's really train them to honor God, 
Well, how do we honor God? The word honor means to give value to. We give value. We want our kids to give value to God. Well, what does that mean? Respect him, honor him, obey him. And even if you honor God, what are you going to do? You're going to honor and respect and obey your parents. And, you know, we, we teach our kids that, or we, we're supposed to. So we teach them to honor God. We teach them to honor us as parents, to show value to us. I, I've said this before. Kids don't understand this, but there's nobody other than God that loves them more than their parents. And we want the best for our kids. I know I can speak for these two. They want nothing best, nothing more than the best. They want nothing more than the best for their kids. And that's because they love them. And, and I would say that about every parent. They want the best for their kids. So that's why we need to teach our kids, listen, you need to honor us because we know what's best for you. You don't, we do. So learn to value us, learn to value other people. Uh, I look in our, our world today and it's like nobody values anybody anymore. It's, you know, we, it's about us and about what we want and you don't count. And I, I don't know that that's just a Christian, it's not a Christian thing, it's a world thing and it's something that is, is in our culture, but it's, it's definitely prevalent. We need to teach our kids that to value other people the way God values them. Every soul is a valuable thing to God, so it should be valuable to us. And sometimes, and this is things we had to deal with with our kids, sometimes they didn't always like people because they were different than them, but we had to teach them, hey, listen, God loves them just as much as he does you, and so you need to value them. You need to value them for who they are, and I am so glad, uh, and does it sound like I'm bragging? Maybe I am a little bit. My kids weren't perfect. <laughs> Trust me, they weren't. But usually my kids were the friends with a lot of the kids that nobody else would be friends with. And that was always cool to me, that my kids valued other people that, that other kids didn't value. And so that, that was neat uh, for me. And then value themselves. That's big, too. Showing value to themselves. What, what does that mean? Well, I mean, it's like uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when it says that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You know, value yourself enough to take pride in, in yourself and keep yourself pure in, in, in ways. And I, 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 we preach and teach that in my home. I preach and teach that in our church. Uh, I expect my children to, to be pure. And, you know, obviously, I, as a parent, I don't know my kids, what they do when they're not around me. But, and, and I, I say this, I, I know for a fact, my two girls, and I believe my son, were all three virgins when they got married. And that tells me something. They honored themselves to protect themselves. That is an important thing that we need to teach our, our, our kids uh, and really, my last one's not married, but that's important, and that's a thing that she's telling this young man. Listen, don't think we're going to be doing any of that until we get married. I said, you go, girl. You go. You tell him. You, he needs to know that. And if you're not going to tell him, I'll tell him. And But that's important to her, and I don't mean to belittle that, but that is an important thing. Let me just say here, I think... Grace is an important thing, and grace covers things, And but that is one of the big ones, I think, that teenagers more frequently give away of themselves, and they got to be careful of that because it's something you can't ever get back. And it, studies have shown, and I'm sure you guys have looked at them too, that when we give away ourselves physically, it does a lot of emotional things. So that is, should be something that is important that we need to stress that so that they should honor themselves. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, Proverbs 3, 9 talks about honoring God with our finances. Matthew 6, 33, uh, we should honor God's agenda for our life. Ephesians 6, 2, honor our parents. And 1 Peter 2, 17 says honor, um, honor all men. Number two, train them to be competent for their age. I went back and redid this today, and I didn't really like the things that I had written. But when I say be, help them to be competent for their age, at different ages, our kids should be doing different things. 
we should expect, um, and we're big on this with the two-year-old and the three-year-old, please and thank you. Show gratitude. That's important. Uh, maybe a three- and four-year-old, I just wrote these down, three, be, should be able to sit in church. And we want them to sit in church. We want them to listen and be able to be still. Maybe a five- and six-year-old uh, to better control their emotions. A seven- and eight-year-old to be able to study and understand a little bit of God's Word, um, especially if they, you know, if they profess Christ, and some at seven and eight do. Um, nine to 12 um, grasping spiritual concepts, 13 to 15, basic independence, 17 uh, or 16 to 18, helping them to be good employees. You know, I've, I know a lot of teenagers that, I say teenagers, 19, 20, they go off to college, they've never had a job. And we with our kids, we, we always, I, I was always, because I didn't have a lot when we were raising our kids, they had to pay for their own gas, their own insurance, and their own cell phone. No questions asked. And so they had to go out and work. And all of my kids worked. I think three of them worked fast food. Uh, one didn't like fast food, didn't work it. But they all went out and got jobs. Uh, the reason they did that is because I wanted to teach them the importance of handling their finances, paying their bills, being faithful and committed to that, and I was a stickler on those things. Those are age-appropriate things. A lot of kids don't have a job until they get out of college, and it's like, okay, um, do you understand what a dollar is and how to save and how to pay your bills on time? Those are important things that kids need to learn. And so we really stress that young, get a job. And all my kid, one of my sons quit baseball in high school, and he was a pretty good baseball player. He told the coach, he said, I, want to, I need to get a job. Now, that hurt my feelings a little bit because I was a baseball player and a baseball coach, and I wanted him to keep playing. But he said, no, I need to get a job and I need to work. So the other half of me was like, huh, okay, maybe we've done something right. And so that was important to him. Um, Remember this, we are always trying in, in the process of working ourselves out of a job as parents, working ourselves out of a job. We want our kids to grow up and be competent so that when they walk out the door, we are confident that they can handle things. And so that should be our goal. Um, it's our job to help them figure these things out, to be competent for their age. Well, how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of things, and I just wrote a few of these down. I don't know if they're in your notes or not. I'll allow them to go places without you. Sleepovers, have jobs, let them make mistakes. We talked about that. Uh, allow them to make decisions on their own. And I wrote this down and I circled it. And I think this is important. Don't foster fear in your kids. I, I, you know, I see parents that are just constantly making their kids fearful. Pandemic, and I don't know what you guys learned from that. I learned as a pastor that people are manipulated very easily into being fearful. I've always wondered, this was always a thing of mine was, okay, how is the Antichrist going to come in? And how is he going to influence so many people? And how is he just going to captivate people and take them away and, you know, lead them? And how could this happen? Now I know. Fear. Fear captivates people. We have always tried to train up our kids in a way that we don't want them to be fearful don't be afraid. My daughter and I had this conversation. I told you I come home from church after a meeting. We're sitting on the front porch. And one thing she told me, she said, Dad, I'm, not, I'm afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? I'm afraid of making a mistake if I pick the wrong guy. I said, listen, we have taught you from the time that you're a little child not to be afraid. God doesn't want you to be afraid. He wants you to live by faith, not by fear. And so I think we need to be careful that we don't create fear in our kids by overprotecting them or over-restraining them or not allowing them to do anything or rescuing them every time something looks a little odd. You know, be careful of that. Fear is not something we want our kids. We want them to be bold. Now, we don't want them to be stupid, and there's a difference. I think there is some things to be afraid of. You know, be afraid of... Fear, a genuine fear of God is good. I think when they're young, a genuine fear sometimes of their parents 
You know, I had I was scared to death of my dad, and I, and, and I don't, you know, I don't want to get into that, but uh, that led to respect later on. But um, don't foster, don't foster fear in your kids. That, that'll come back to bite you and them. And then lastly, train them to succeed at being who they are. I underlined that. I wanted to emphasize it: who they are, not who you want them to be. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we, we have an idea of what our kids should be and what we want them to be. And so we push them down that road and hope that the, it works for them, but train them to succeed at being who they are. Well, who are they? Well, I, I wrote some things down and this is just a small example of what our list could be. We want to train them to be able to discern their spiritual gifts, their talents and abilities. We want them to use those talents and abilities. Uh, Charlie can sing. He can play. I think that's tremendous. I, I said last night I, 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 I don't like guys to do it. I, I was just kidding. I hope you understand that. I think it's wonderful. I love talented people. My talents don't lie in those areas. Uh, Give me a two before and some nails and a hammer and I can build anything. But sing, I scare everybody to death. Uh, but, you know, I, and one of the things, our, our daughter is the only one in the family that really had the ability to sing. And so do you think we fostered that? Of course we did. She got active in school and she sang in choir, in select choir, and she would use her talent. She took some, I think she took some lessons from a, a voice teacher in our community, and she wanted to do that, and we wanted her to do that because that was important to her. And now she's probably, she's not the leader of our group, our, our, our praise and worship group, but she is probably the lead vocalist in that. And she's got a booming voice, great voice. And so she, every week she brings honor and glory to God through her talents. And I, I think that's what we, we want them to do. We want them to be successful about that. I, I think we need to train them to succeed at their faith. Now, I, I mean that in two ways. Number one, their faith as in what they believe. We want them to carry that out. But more so, I want them to succeed at trusting God. And that's something that we have tried to teach. And I won't, not perfectly. Uh, we want them to trust God at every age. And as they get older, that it goes out and further. And, and now, you know, I'm telling my daughter, listen, trust the Lord with your mate. And she said, but what if I make a mistake? What if I make a mistake? Trust God. And I said, God has put some things in your life to help you make that decision. And one of them is your parents. So bring him around. Let us see him. You've got friends that have been praying for you. You know, listen to them. Listen to the people that God has put in your life. Listen to the voices that he puts in your life. And, and so I would, I've told her, I said, trust the Lord. He's, gonna, he's not going to let you make a mistake if you genuinely want to do what's right and please him. When we go ahead and bust through the door, that's when we make mistakes. But we need to make sure that we're trusting God. Take a stand uh, is something else. Succeed at taking a stand. Leadership. You know, I've, I've heard parents say this before. They say, listen, my kid's not a leader. I totally disagree. I think every kid's a leader. It's just a matter of what kind of leader they are. And some may not be the kind of leader that is outward, Sometimes they're leading, and I was this way. I wasn't a in-your-face, outward type of leader, but I was more of a, I'm going this direction, and if you want to go with me, you can, but if you don't want to, that's fine, but this is where I'm going. Okay, and, and it's figuring out the kind of personality your kids are, the kind of leader they are, and then working on that and help them to be successful in that. We want them to be leaders in their home. We want them to be leaders in their community, leaders in their church. It's what they need to be, and that's something that we can help them, train them to succeed at. We also want to train them to succeed at working hard. The Bible says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Put everything you got into it. Uh, from athletics to academics to their job, their career, their college, we have taught our kids, do the best you can, work hard. Why? Because it honors God. It's important. So train them to succeed in that. Uh, I wrote down in here, and I, I've probably mentioned this before, uh, success in God's eyes is usually different than ours. 
you know, when I, when I would look at my kids and say, okay, I want you to be successful, I may have a different view than what God does. And I know parents have said, I want my, <clears throat> my kids to be a doctor. I want them to be this. I want them to be that. I want them to be a college athlete. I want them to be a pro athlete. And they work really hard at doing those things for their kids or pushing them in a direction. But that is not success for God. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, I was had some time to spend with Braden. Uh, was it yesterday? No, Thursday when I came into town. We had some time together, and he wants to be maybe a heart surgeon or something like that. I said, that's great. We need Christian heart surgeons. We need that. But, you know, that may not be what he ends up doing. He may be doing something else. Success really boils down to knowing and doing the will of God for your life and following his plan. That is success. And I, if I can have that in my kids, that's great. Um, last thing, I, I thought three was, four is, teach them their identity in Christ. I've mentioned this. Um, I'm not going to, if I had more time, I would ask you uh, this question. I ask our people this when I teach on this. Who are you? Tell me who you are. And I, I get some interesting answers. Well, I am a dad, I'm a husband, I am a electrician, I am a carpenter, I'm this, I'm that. No, I want to know who you are. I don't know what you, what you want to do. Uh, I, don't know, I don't want to know what you do. I want to know who you are. And so finally we get to this place and say, okay, listen, let me tell you who you are. You are loved, accepted, complete, equipped. If you're a believer, uh, special, God's child, united with Christ, secure, free, you're a fruit bearer, you're God's workmanship, uh, all of these things, this is who you really are. What you do is not who you are. The world, the flesh, and the devil will lie to our lie to us and lie to our kids and tell them that they are something they're not. And they will try to label and tell our kids, you are this, you are that. Uh, but that's not what God says. And a lot of our kids get hung up in that. This social media thing that I was talking about earlier, a lot of kids struggle with that because they see these profiles and they see these people on, on Facebook and Instagram and all of these things and they say, wow, that's a great life. I wish I could have that. In reality, they don't understand that that's really not who they are either. That is what they're putting out there, but that's not who they are. And so the world tells us through commercials and through people and everything that you know, this is who you are. This is who, No, what does God say about you? That's the most important thing. And I have found in my life, as well as those others around me, if we can figure out who we are in Christ, whew, that is so much helpful in dealing with all the difficulties in life. Because really, when it comes down to it, it's not what others say I am, it's what God says I am. That I can hang my hat on. That's truth. Um, uh, if they're not saved, younger younger kids who may not believer, be believers, you may not be able to teach them identity, but you can teach them uh, and point them to who God is, what God wants to do in their life, that they are special, that they're loved, and talk about God's goodness. You know, teach them those things because those are the things will help them to... Um, to one day become a believer. And then uh, the last thing I would say is the world focuses. I said focus. I, I may not know whether you changed that, but hopefully you did. The world focuses on externals. God focuses on the internals. Those are what's important to God is what's on the inside. The inner man is important to God. The outer man, yeah, sure. Yeah, I would say God is interested in the outer man, but he's more interested far more interested on the, in the inner man, on the internals, the heart. And that's really what we do as parents. We focus on the heart and helping our children have the right heart. And so how do we do that? I mean, just to sum it all up, it begins with us having that right relationship with God, growing in our relationship so that we spiritually can have a good marriage. And, and a good marriage is important. It's important in raising a family. And then as we 
have a home, having a good home will then lead to a good family. And so it all begins with me, but it doesn't end with me. It's to go on into my wife, into my, I'm not, I don't have a husband, but she would say to her husband and into the children. And then we can enjoy some, a great family later on, Lord willing. And so it, it, it is important. Raising children is not just about raising children. It's being who God wants you to be. And in that, you can have great success as a parent. Father, thank you for just the privilege of sharing truth, your truth. And Lord, we know that there's a lot of good advice. There's a lot of tremendous books. There is a lot of people out there saying a lot of things about parenthood and home and family and marriage and being the best person you can be. But there's no substitute for the work of God's word, your word, and your spirit in us. And if we will just heed your word and follow your spirit, we can have a great life, we can have a great marriage, we can have a great home. And Lord, that's not defined by the externals, that's defined by the internals. And so help us to get on that same page with you. And so Father, we thank you for what you've taught us. Help us to now just be the doer, a doer of the word and not a hearer only. In Jesus' name, amen.